I guess seven, he founded his company called Savi Optics Corporation, where he's been working since then. And he is uh, very interested in the um, uh, in the ISO technical committee. He's very active there. And today he's going to tell us about the new developments in ISO standards for optics. But before I pass over to him, I should yeah. that, uh, that uh, Dave is a fellow of SPIE. And he also received the uh, A.E. Conradi Award from SPI in 2021. He's currently serving as the chair of the Technical Advisory Committee of the, of the ISO. So with that, uh, Dave, it's all for you. Please go ahead. No, oh, thanks very much. Hello, everybody, um, and thanks for having me for this colloquium. I, I actually am thrilled to see that the tradition of coffee and donuts uh, for a colloquium continues after, what, 40 years or so since, uh, since I took uh, geometrical optics from Duncan. Um, I'm sorry, Professor Moore. Um, and, but before I start... Uh, Dave, I'm still Duncan. Okay. <laughs> Well, I know things have changed since the 80s. Used to be first names were okay, then they weren't. I don't know. I don't know where we are anymore. Um, but I do want to establish my um, my nerd cred here before I start. Um, you'll notice there's two logos on this first slide. The right one is the Optics and Electro-Optics Standards Council. These are the guys who um, represent the United States for optics standards, both nationally and internationally. But the left-hand side, that logo for Savvy Optics Corp, that's my corporate logo. <coughs> And I am proud to say this was designed by my daughter uh, 15 years ago. And it actually, I'm told, says Savvy Optics Corp in circular Gallifreyan, the language of the people from uh, the planet where Doctor Who comes from. So there you go, <laughs> for whatever it's worth. Um, okay, Heard. so let's get... <laughs> thank you, yeah. thank you. I'll take it. Let's see, am I uh, able to go forward? Here we go. Okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about. And I understand um, Professor Knox was actually talking about standards today in engineering and design, which is great. Glad to hear it. Um, I think there isn't enough um, discussion about standards in the industry in general, much less inside the universities. So I'm thrilled to hear that that's part of the U.S., the um, U of R curriculum. Um, so I'm going to start with kind of a really high level like super high level standards in general, and then where do they come from and what do they do? And then we'll get into the optics material like ISO 10110 and some of the other standards that really don't get talked about as much. And you know, I know this is a riveting topic, so I'm sure we have a packed house. It's always really crowded when people talk about standards. So um, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so let's just take an initial assumption of a world with no standards at all. Oh, I, I also have to give credit to Richie Youngworth, by the way, uh, who couldn't be here today, but he and I actually have developed this together, this little little talk. Uh, he gave it at the University of Arizona, and then I gave something similar at University of North Carolina. So, so we're going to start with an assumption of a world with no standards, okay? And we all know the story of the... Um, the tortoise and the hare, or I hope we all know the story of uh, Aesop's fable about the tortoise and the hare, right? And the story of the tortoise and the hare, the hare was making fun of the tortoise because he was so slow and the tortoise uh, offered to run a race with the rabbit, with the hare to show that he wasn't that slow. Um, and the hare thought this would be great fun. So they convinced the fox who agreed to be the judge and he specified a kilometer for the race and they started off. And in our version of the story, the hare took off and was far out of sight, and he easily covered the kilometer distance, so he just laid down beside the course and take a nap, took a nap until the tortoise could catch up. And the tortoise, meanwhile, uh, kept going slowly but steadily, and after a time, passed the place where the hare was sleeping, and continued the race until he'd cover a kilometer with the hare nowhere in sight. So who won? The hare? The tortoise? Or... Was there no meaningful competition because we don't know what a kilometer is, right? Mm -hmm. In a world without standards, there is no such thing as a kilometer. There is no such thing as a pound or a kilogram or a second even, right? These are all standardized units. Um, so really, in a world without standards, if the answer isn't zero, it's one, right? And we just, you know, we just neglect the units. It's, it's the only thing that's significant is, is it zero or is it not? So clearly there's a place for units and measures and standards. The standardization has extended far beyond 
uh, units and measures, but obviously that's the starting point, right? Um, the fun thing about standards is they're, um, they're something that my wife refers to as 99% invisible, right? They're, they're, they're there and they're doing their thing and you don't even notice them. And the point of this little talk is to sort of bring some attention to the fact that these standards are important and they really do have an important role to play in the world in general, but more importantly, optics in specific. So, so why do we develop these standards? Well, uh, the ISO standards uh, charter says ISO standards mean that consumers can have confidence that their products are safe, reliable, and of good quality. Okay, well, that's great. Um, but also uh, standards can be used by regulators and governments to establish safety and uh, public health. And there's lots of other arguments that standards can be used as a, as a, a tool to reduce cost, to satisfy customer needs, and really facilitate commerce in general. Um, but the real reason why I think standards are most important, especially in, in this day and age, is um, in many cases, the best defense against bad regulations are good voluntary standards, right? And so if we, if we as an industry can't standardize on something, then we should expect governments to step in and do it for us. And that's often not the best way to standardize. So we're obviously gonna talk mostly about drawings today and drawings are all about efficiency and accuracy in engineering communication. Um, and, and I think you'll agree by the end of this talk that, uh, that those drawing standards are worthwhile and worth, worth using. Okay, so where do they come from and what do they do? Standards have been around for a very, very long time. In fact, standards actually predate human history. Uh, the calendar standards date back to the 20th millennium BCE. And, and if, if that's not um, sufficient convincement, uh, convinced, if that's not sufficiently convincing for you, though the standards on weights and measures, which is what most people kind of think of that as the standard, the, the beginning of standards, they don't really think about calendars, although there is an international standard for calendars as well. But even weights and measures dates back to the fifth millennium BCE. All the weights and measures standards evolved from a bunch of original weights and measure standards that was established by the, um, in the Indus Valley in the fifth millennium BCE in, Egypt, in India. Um, but they really took off during the age of empires. In the age of empires, uh, what, uh, what happened is the larger these governmental systems um, spread, the more difficulty they had managing the differences between cultures and norms in all the different parts of their empires. So the early empires just loved standards and they standardized everything. Um, oddly enough, uh, one, of the, one of the legends about standards is that Rome standardized um, road widths, right? And that, that there's this old myth about how railroads trace back to the width of a horse's ass in Rome. That's actually not true. But I mean, one, one of the few things Rome didn't standardize is roads. Um, uh, China did and Egypt did, but Rome did not. But the, um, the fun thing about the Roman standardization efforts is they actually had a god of standards. God Rhianus is the god of standards in the Roman pantheon. I, can you imagine, you know, hanging out with Zeus and Rhianus and um, talking about a standard pint of mead or whatever? I, I don't know. I think it's kind of funny. Okay. Most of the standards we know today actually trace their origin to the, um, the Industrial Revolution, right? And as of the mid 19th century, really there was very little in the way of uh, popular standardization for industry. And it's hard for me to imagine life before 1841, for example. In, in, before 1841, there was no standard screw thread, for example. So if you wanted a fastener, you made a, a bolt and you made a nut and they matched. And then if you wanted another one, you made another bolt and you made another nut. There was no standard, right? So every fastener was custom made. It's kind of just, just mind blowing how much, what, what a loss of efficiency that must have been in the early 19th century. Um, ultimately in the 1840s and 1850s, the Industrial Revolution really um, uh, spread yeah. more of these national and international, actually just national standards. And um, what we saw is individual industries started standardizing. And one of the, the most famous ones, of course, is the railroad gauge standards. 
uh, which allowed us to have travel, the Intercontinental Railroad, for example. Um, when the Intercontinental Railroad was built in the US, there was no US national rail width rail gauge standard. And um, <clears throat> the, the union actually decided to create a standard uh, simply by saying, this is the gauge we will use to go over the Rocky Mountains. And, be, and the only reason they picked that particular gauge was the engines that could get over the Rocky Mountains were the Stevenson's engines that were made to um, haul coal in Northumbria. And that was the engine they picked. And based on that engine, they picked the gauge that that engine supported. And then if you wanted to connect to the uh, Transcontinental Railroad, you needed to have uh, the same railroad gauge. So that created this, this rail gauge standard. And, and even so, there was half a dozen different railroad gauge standards across the country. You just had to have switching yards to, to go from one gauge to another. So early standards really uh, were pretty effective um, within a single industry and within a single country. But when we started trading uh, internationally in the Industrial Revolution, some of these standards actually impaired trade and, and became um, conflicts because now, you know, my fasteners didn't fit into your fasteners, for example. So we really had to kind of make a more international standard effort. And really, that didn't come until the, the end of the uh, First World War at the beginning of the 20th century. And that's really when international standardization became a thing. Um, today, uh, the International Standards Organization, or ISO, and the International Electrotechnical Commission, or IEC, sort of established hegemony over all international standards. And the way this works is um, each nation can have its own standards developing organizations, right? So in the U.S., we have ANSI, we have ASME, IEEE, there's a bunch of them, right? But for ISO and IEC, only one standards writing body is allowed to participate in each for each country in the international standards. So um, ANSI represents the United States, for example, not ASME, not IEEE, right? So if IEEE wants to produce a standard that is an ISO or IEC standard, they've got to go through ANSI to do it. And a lot of people don't realize countries don't participate in standards, standards writing organizations participate in standards. So France is represented by AFNOR, Japan represented by JESC, Rom Romania is ASRO, Germany is the Deutsche Institut for Normung. Um, each country is represented by a standards writing body. And, um, <clears throat> and how that is managed actually winds up being kind of country by country. Some countries have just complete government funding for their standards. Other countries like the US has pretty much complete uh, independent participation. And, and then other countries kind of have a mix where industry participates, uh, government sends some representatives, and then maybe, you know, the government will kick in some money to, to um, compensate the experts, the industrial experts. So you can see in this map, just about every country in the world today actually participates in standards. And, um, and this map is actually kind of breathtaking. It's, it's amazing how many countries actually now are participating. And, and this is just ISO, not, not to mention IEC. So, the, so what, what are we talking about? Standards are not, most people think of standards as like the standard kilometer or something. That's, that, that's not exactly right. The standards that I'm talking about are actually documents. And these are documents that describe things like comparison standards or weights and measures and whatnot. So these documents actually are reviewed every five years. Every single one is reviewed every five years by the committee that manages it. And that committee has to answer two questions. One, are they being used? And two, are they up to date? If there aren't at least five participating countries that are using the standard, then it's withdrawn. And if it isn't up to date, it has to be re uh, revised. So uh, this is like a table that, that is a report on a particular standard where every country that's participating in this committee, this happens to be the one of the committees that I participate in, uh, has to vote whether we will withdraw, confirm, or revise a given standard. And, and that's, that's done every five years. And so what does it look like when we revise standards? Well, you know, 
I know all of you are thinking that, wow, developing standards, that must be super glamorous. That would be really cool. But it's actually not as cool as you're thinking. It's actually a lot of work. Um, and this is, this is a, I love this. I mean, this is a, a typical thing of what I do as a standards writer, right? So you have this, this table, everybody gets a copy of the standard, we read it, and then each country, each expert actually submits a comment. So for example, this first comment, Germany comment number 34 um, says in sub in clause six, figure 19, there is no information about the note indicator A. Therefore, you should delete the indicator, right? And then the, the um, project leader says accepted, then to implement, et cetera. So, I mean, it's literally that level. Every single line has to be justifiable and actionable. And if it isn't, then the comments are rejected. For the most part, all comments are accepted. Um, and it is only when there are two comments which conflict that we actually have to have a meeting to discuss it. Now, I want to do a case study here. We're going to zoom in on, um, on that, that big map in the beginning and focus on Central Africa, a small country called Burundi. No doubt everybody here has been, so I won't go into a lot of the details. I'm just kidding. Um, I imagine none of you have been to Burundi. If anybody has, um, you know, please shout out. That'd be great. Anybody been to Burundi? Yeah, that's what I thought. It's on everybody's to-do list. Nobody gets the time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Burundi. So according to the CIA fact book, the country is the 146th largest country in the world. It's slightly smaller than Maryland. Um, Thanks to the definition of a kilometer, or actually the definition of a meter, we know that the total area of the country is 27,834 square kilometers. Yeah. Um, thanks to ISO 6709, we know where it is. It's at minus 333 south uh, plus 30 uh, east. And, and interestingly enough, the CIA facts book doesn't actually use the international standard for coordinates, which is <laughs> kind of funny. Um, uh, its country code is BI, according to ISO 3166, and its population is between 12 and 13 million. Okay, so this is a small country about the size of Maryland in Central Africa. According to the UN, it is on the list of least developed countries in the world. So this, is, this country is very, very poor and very underdeveloped. And even Burundi participates in international standards. They currently participate as a voting member of ISO TC 34, subcommittee 17. So TC is technical committee and SC is subcommittee. So that's the food safety um, standards committee. ISO TC 285, Clean Cook Stoves and Clean Cooking Solutions, and the very recently formed ISO TC 323, Circular Economy, which is just a fancy word for sustainable and uh, sustainable economy. So, you know, if a country as poor as Burundi can find standards activities that are worth paying to participate in, I think that really tells you that we can all benefit from standards. Um, so what can you standardize? Really practically anything, um, if it makes sense. But a lot of times, a lot of people don't agree with what you want to standardize. Um, and so there's, I, I think the best way to appreciate standards is when we have failed to establish them, right? I mean, what side of the road do you drive on when you go to a, go to a country? Well, that's not standard, right? You, you, there's only two choices, <laughs> and yet somehow we couldn't come up with an international standard. I mean, we're we're ignoring the obvious problem that the United States continues to defy the entire world by using the imperial system instead of metric. Um, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm always frustrated that the American metricization is continuing to move forward inch by inch. But um, <laughs> even greater failure than that is electrical outlets. What a horrible, horrible waste of money and energy goes into the, the fact that we couldn't standardize on electrical outlets for AC mains, right? We've established that AC power is the way you power everything. Nobody's, there's no DC countries. And yet the AC mains vary by voltage. 
uh, they vary by uh, uh, electrical configuration and what a huge pain in the neck this is, right? When I'm getting on a plane and flying to Switzerland, I got to go, oh, wait, wait, I got to go look up the standard outlet for Switzerland and get my little adapter and pop it into my briefcase. So, so it's cases where we've failed that you really see what we've succeeded at. And so some of the more common uses of standards, weights and measures. I mean, it, it is impossible to imagine a world without weights and measures. And, and we've had weights and measures really for 7,000 years. So it's not surprising that it's hard to imagine a world without them. Units, right? Units are standardized worldwide. Um, probably the most commonly understood standard is actually management system standards, right? The ISO 9000 standard, I think, is the most famous ISO standard, even though it's not the most used. Um, but then you've also got regulatory standards, which are really important, safety standards, which are really important, um, quality standards, uh, communication standards. I mean, this whole, the fact that there is a USB-C is just a wonderful thing, right? I just, I think that's just fantastic. I can use the same connector and charge my, um, um, my headset as I do charge my phone. I think that's just wonderful, right? And, and then down at the bottom of the list is technical communications, like drawings, testing, material properties, and things like that. So that's the one we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on things that enable commerce and communication. Um, just as a fun fact, um, I, well, before I got involved in standards, I did not know that the majority of countries in the world actually use a decimal comma instead of a decimal point. I don't know how many of you knew that, but maybe you're today years old when you found out. Um, I grew up with the decimal point or the dot. And, um, and I, I will say that more people use a decimal point than a decimal comma, but more countries have standardized to the decimal comma. Um, and actually, the origin is really kind of interesting. When um, it, it, before offset typing, we actually wrote separatrix, which is the name for the, the uh, decimal point, decimal comma, it's the separatrix. We actually wrote it by changing the font size for things after the digit. And that survives in some currency notations, like you can see down in the bottom right-hand corner, right? You'd write 1995 and you'd draw a bar and then write the smaller font on top of the bar. Well, when you're doing offset typing, that's a real pain in the neck. Right, that's really difficult to do. So what they decided to do instead was just use some kind of a separator, pulling any other thing out of the drawer that could go between the numbers to the left of the decimal and the numbers to the right of the decimal. And a bunch of different ones were chosen, and the dot and the comma survived. And, um, and another interesting fact is there's a a third commonly used decimal separator called the muyuz, which is actually only used in the Arab countries, and it's a vertical line. Anyway, so, but we digress. So, okay, so these are some of the famous standards or some of the standards that you, you don't even know they exist and yet you use them every single day. Every time you look at your watch, you're using ISO 8601, the standard for dates and times. Um, whenever you send a letter, you're using ISO 3166, the country code standard, right? Uh, of course, ISO 9001, we already talked about. Um, 1345 is just this huge <laughs> standard for quality management systems for regulatory purposes for medical devices, right? 14001, environmental management systems. Um, the clean room standard, 14644. Uh, the test and, and calibration method standard, 17025. Anyway, the list goes on. My favorite, actually, on this list is the last one, ISO 80,000. And if you're ever you know, kind of between tasks and you just have that hankering to read a standard, that's the one I would recommend. It's just, it's just great. It's, um, there's multiple parts and it goes through every possible quantity and unit that you can think of for um, scientific and, and maybe everything, but certainly from my point of view, from scientific notation. So let's do a quick exercise and see how good you guys are at fundamental psi units. There are seven fundamental psi units. Does anybody know what they are? Anybody want to shout out? Kilogram. Kilogram, that's one. Good. One down, Am six to go. Ampere. The ampere, is the ampere a standard? No, I don't the think coulomb. it is. Um, coulomb. Okay. The coulomb. Oh, I'm not sure that's a standard. 
Meter. 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 There we go. That one I know about. Mole. Second. Candela. The mole. Someone said mole. That's the one everybody always forgets. Good. The second I heard. Candela. Candela. Very good. So that's the one that most people leave off. Uh, it was there was the ampere that was correct. The other one that we we missed was temperature, right? Kelvin. Um, luminous intensity or the candela is actually the most recent addition to the SI units, and I think it was not that long ago. It was like 2015 or something. It was fairly recent. Um, but I actually think that we should have an eighth fundamental unit in this modern age of social networks. I think we should have a Wheaton as a standard of Twitter followers. 500,000 Twitter followers. I'm not the first person to propose this. I'm just saying maybe we should go ahead and standardize. So um, Elon Musk currently has 219.6 Wheatons and um, Will Wheaton himself only has 5.4 Wheatons. But when this was originally proposed, he had 500,000. So, you know, there you go. Just goes to show it's an important physical unit. And maybe you can replace Twitter with Mastodon or whatever you like. That's I don't care. I'm I'm pretty agnostic about this. Okay, so I know that's kind of just been a little bit of light fluff um, and more general than it is optics. So now we're going to drill down into the optic standards. But I really wanted to kind of get you guys thinking about standards in general, not just standards in optics. So in the optics world. Um, these are kind of the big hitters. ISO 1101 is, is geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. It's really a mechanical standard, but we use it in optics as well. So it's really important. Um, ISO 10110, which we're going to talk more about and is my personal favorite of the optic standards, um, is, is designed to be a part of 1101, right? It's part of GD&T. That's the idea. Um, but then there's an, a whole series of environmental standards, 9022, coding standards, 9211. Uh, raw glass, one two one two three. This is becoming increasingly popular in the U.S. Um, Fourteen nine ninety test methods for telescopes. That's another commonly cited standard. Um, the IEC standard six zero eight two five for laser safety is is big. And then recently, it's been a lot in the news. Is IEC six two four seven one? Well, in the standards news, I guess um, for photobiological safety for lamps and lamp systems, just because of all the um, uh, light exposure issues associated with VR and AR. So that's become a kind of a popular standard these days. So why do we have all these standards? Well, optics fabrication is all about producing quality parts, right? But the quality is kind of like that kilometer in the in Aesop's fable. If you don't define quality, you have no way to tell whether the job is done. So um, so the key thing that the ISO 10110 standard does is it establishes a nomenclature and a set of rules for optics quality. So let's talk about ISO 10110. Here's an example of an ISO 10110 drawing. Um, uh, hopefully everyone in the room is familiar with this format. If you're not, I really recommend you um, um, add this to your list of things to do. Um, this is probably the most important standard in optics today. Um, just to give you a walkthrough, the top part is the drawing field, the middle part is the table field, and then of course the bottom part is the title field. So the drawing field is again driven by ISO um, 1101, so this is GD and T notation for basically the mechanical dimensions and the mechanical size stuff. And then really the business end of the ISO 10110 drawing is the table field. And the table field in a simple singlet has three parts. It has a left surface, um, a materials, and a right surface. And then those surfaces all have notations for the optical quality that's required based on the different kinds of things that we need in optics, right? right. ISO 1101 and gd and in general, they don't cover optical components at the level that we need them to be covered. So ISO 1101 augments gd and to create that notation to allow us to talk about the quality of the optics that we're making. So um, the way it's done is it's shown with a numerical code or a symbol for each of the different tolerances that are associated with optics. So zero slash is birefringence, one slash is bubbles and inclusions, and so on. Um, kind of the, the business end of this really is the uh, surface standards, which is our three slash, four slash, and five slash for figure, wedge, and surface quality. But 
everything that is optical related has a section in ISO um, 10110. And it's all broken down into parts. So um, ISO 10110 part one is the general format and the structure of the drawing system. Um, part five is the surface form standard. So that's the one for um, uh, figure and form. Part six is centering. Part seven is imperfections. Part eight is texture. And part nine is surface treatments and coatings. And in 1994, that's, that was it. That was all of ISO 10110. And it was all based on the German DIN 3140. Um, since 1994, when the original um, 10 parts were published, we've added another nine parts. Um, and then a couple have been withdrawn. But uh, you can see the different parts that have been added. We'll go into a couple of these in detail in a little bit. Um, so that's ISO 10110. And if, you, um, if you're in optics today, I would claim you should know about ISO 10110, that everybody at this point knows what it is whether they're using it or not. What is less common is an understanding of all the other standards that are associated with ISO 10110. So for example, uh, measurement methods, ISO 14997 is a critical standard for ISO 10110 because if you specify the imperfections according to part seven, part seven doesn't tell you how to evaluate the surface for imperfections. You have to look at the measurement standard for that, which is 14997. Similarly, you can use part five to describe surface form, but you need ISO 14999 to actually tell you how to measure the surface form. Um, you can use part 17 for laser damage, but you can't figure out how to test it without ISO 21254 and so on. So, so these measurement standards are a key part, kind of an adjunct of ISO 10110. And but but doesn't end there. Um, part nine, surface treatment and coating, uh, lovely standard. It uh, tells you kind of a general notation. It has a little lambda with a circle around it to indicate a coating or a surface treatment. But it doesn't tell you anything about how to actually write down what your requirements are. That's in ISO 9211. So 9211 has eight parts and actually includes the notation system for uh, spectral performance, how to do um, um, environmental specifications, durability specifications, all that's described in the 9211 series, not in ISO 10110. And all those standards are equally important, right? We have to standardize this stuff or you haven't determined what the optical quality really is. Um, at the bottom right, there's a whole host of standards that have been more or less ignored in the United States until now. And that's the environmental standards for optics, uh, optics and photonics. Um, mostly in the US, we use a MIL standard, um, MIL standard 810G, uh, which is a huge document that applies to everything from you know UAVs to street signs. Um, but this standard is just ours. It's just for optical components. And it's a much more streamlined system that's much easier to use. Um, it's hard to show how dynamic these standards are, but, but this is my, my attempt to do it, right? Um, here I'm showing not just the parts that are currently active, but the parts that have actually been replaced. So parts two, three, and four are withdrawn, and they were replaced by part 18 in 2018. Um, parts five and six are currently under revision. Um, part 10 was withdrawn and the material was absorbed into part one. Um, and then parts 11 and 16 are also under revision. But we've just published revisions in the last five years of parts 1, 7, 8, 12, and 18, right? So this, these standards are constantly being reviewed, constantly being maintained, constantly being updated by these committees. And that's because the needs change over time, right? The way we make optical components in the 21st century is different from the way we made them in 19. 78 when the original version of the standard was written. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about freeforms and generalized surfaces. Um, so this is an area of, of great interest in the optics community today. I know academia, you guys tend to stay a good five to 10 years ahead of the rest of the power curve. The rest of us are just generally catching up to where uh, the U of R was a decade ago. But today, modern manufacturing techniques have really enabled design and fabrication of an entirely new class of optical component, which is a really big deal. Um, and so these surfaces wind up 
of having no axis of symmetry. And we usually call them free forms, um, but that free form term gets different interpretations in different countries. So we've tried to avoid it in most of the standards work. Um, and these have been common in non-imaging applications since the 1980s, but now the, the manufacturing techniques are enabling us to make precision free forms that can actually be used in imaging systems. And this is a real important part of optical design today. Um, the, the problem with them is there's, there's no clean notation to describe them in a drawing, right? So what we had to do is write an entire section of ISO 10110 so that you could include a freeform surface description and people would understand what it was. And tolerancing was even worse, right? So that was a pretty big deal. So in 2015, we published part 19 of 10.110 to address the, the way we talk about freeforms on optics drawings. And, and that system, it's called general surface descriptions. You can use it to describe a flat if you want, but it would be a waste. Um, uh, you, can, you can use it for um, really pretty much any optical surface. It's a generalized format for describing an optical surface. But the place it's really used is parts with bilateral symmetry or no axis of symmetry at all. Um, when, and one of the ways these things telescope is when we did part 19, we realized, okay, so now we can we have a notation for describing a free form, but we haven't defined anywhere how to create a coordinate system or how to move from a global coordinate to a local coordinate. And we haven't told people how they have to structure their coordinate transforms. So we then went back and revised part one um, to add global coordinates, which really should apply to the entire system, not just to free forms, right? Because there's no reason we shouldn't be able to include um, local coordinates uh, and co coordinate transforms. So we revised um, part one as a result of doing part 19. And then we found, well, we also need more generalized versions of surface forms and more generalized surface, uh, more generalized versions of centering. And so those standards have been revised as well. So um, the, the basic concept is you, you replace the radius of curvature, which is the simplest possible surface shape with the symbol GS. And then you can either describe a surface equation if you have a surface equation, or you can attach a, um, a cloud of points file, right? And then the coordinate reference points have to be indicated. And those coordinate reference points are also tolerant with respect to the general surface coordinates. Once you've described what it is you want, there are a bunch of ways you can do surface form error. The simplest is probably just use ISO 10110 part five, right? Because most of the time we still have a circular aperture and some kind of a image circle in the field. And so we are, we're still interested in the deviation from a spherical wavefront. So ISO 10110 part five is excellent at describing deviations from the spherical wavefront. So if I have a surface, this is my measured surface, and this is my surface that I wanted, I can subtract those, and then I can tolerance that based on a traditional um, optical surface. Or I can use ISO 1101, the GD&T system, or you can kind of, uh, the standard part 19 includes a way to come up with your own kind of notation for what would describe the quality of your particular generalized surface. Um, one of the biggest advances in my mind in standardization in ISO 10110 in the last decade is the grand unified surface imperfection standard. There have traditionally been two notation systems and, and measurement systems for specifying the quality of an optical surface. One is called scratch and dig, and it's based on the visibility of imperfections. And this is pretty much the default standard for uh, throughout the world for all commercial and industrial optics. Uh, the other method is a dimensional method which is based on the size or the area of the imperfections. And that has a long history in lasers and precision optics, right? So, so these two systems existed, but all in different documents. One was the scratch and dig was typically referenced back to the American mill perf 13830B. Whereas the isodimensional method was most often referenced back to DIN 3140. So um, the committee in 2013, just under a decade ago, decided that 
it, the only way we were going to get the United States to broadly adopt ISO 10110 was to add scratch and dig notation to the international standard for surface imperfections. So in 2017, we actually published a new version of 10110 part seven and 14997, which added that scratch, scratch and dig notation. It's, it's not perfect, but it is a big step forward, especially for people uh, when your manufacturers or your customers are in the US. So this is what the, the DIN-based specification system looks like. It's a fairly complex documentation of the number and size of imperfections you're allowed. Whereas if you wanted to specify visibility, you'd just write five slash, which is the symbology for surface imperfections, and then you'd write your scratch and dig spec. Um, another area where we've really moved forward in the last five years is in materials tolerances. So, so standards material tolerances in ISO 10110, stress bar fringes, bubbles and inclusions, homogeneity and stria. These have been in 10110 for a very long time, but they apply to the finished part. And in many cases, measuring these parameters after the part has been fabricated is problematic. So, and in addition, you have to buy the blank if you're a manufacturer. So um, there is a new notation in part 18, which adds a zero in front of the requirement to indicate the blank specification. So zero, zero slash is the stress by refringence of the blank that's to be manufactured. And zero, one slash is bubbles and inclusions of the blank. Zero, two slash is the homogeneity and stride of the blank. And in addition, there's a whole different standard, ISO 12123, which has a whole host of other material requirements that you may want to add that apply only to the blank and not to the finished part. Uh, we also revised ISO 10110 part eight. Um, it's probably going to go through another revision, but for now, the last revision we did added the aerially defined systems for statistical properties. So aerially defined root mean square, uh, aerially, de aerially defined PSD, and aerially defined uh, RMS surface slope have now been added. So you can actually write, a lot of people kind of were squeamish about writing RQ for their surface texture when they knew it was going to be evaluated with an aerial device like a, a scanning white light interferometer. So now we've solved that problem and you can actually specify SQ and delta SQ, uh, S delta Q, sorry. Um, we recently published part 16, which is, um, the is really active in the areas of AR and uh, uh, AR, VR, and MR applications, mostly with the holographic combiners, so AR, MR. Um, so holographic combiners are described in part 16. Uh, CGH surfaces are described in part 16. Um, and then some, some kiniform surfaces as well. So um, this is actually, I don't know if it's been published yet. It's like right on the bubble. So hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have part 16. Um, and I think, I think it's a good start. Um, but I think it's probably going to be revised in, in five years, um, and we've got more work to do for diffractive surface descriptions. Anyway, if I went too fast, and I know I did, this is meant to be kind of a once over lightly type approach. I mean, we don't have four hours to like we do in when we do some of the classes um, that I work with uh, uh, Dr. Nelson on. Um, but you, you do have this poster, I'm sure, somewhere in the building. And this is Eric Herman's uh, decoder ring poster, which has a ISO 10110 drawing in the middle, and then a bunch of bubbles that show you all the different ways you can specify that particular parameter, right? And it goes through really remarkable detail. It's a really very, very good poster, and I really recommend it. Um, oops, sorry. There we go. Uh, there's also a book that you can uh, take a look at. Um, uh, during COVID, uh, Eric Herman proposed to Richie Youngworth and I that we publish, um, basically republish Parks and Kimmel, which was a book published back in the 90s, really more or less um, simultaneous with the original version of ISO 10110. And it was meant as a companion document to help people understand how to implement ISO 10110 back in the early days. Um, these days, I think the marketplace is a little more sophisticated. So we took a kind of a higher level approach uh, to the book, but um, we did just finish this um, this year and it's uh, currently available on SPIE.org. Um, and I, I can't, I'm proud to say that it is currently the most popular book sold on SPIE Press. And I think um, 
Um, I, I, I think that's still the case, although I haven't checked lately. Okay. So real quickly, let's talk about some other standards you should know about. And I already mentioned all of these, but I want to drill down a little bit deeper. So ISO 9211 is the ISO is the coding standards, and it breaks down into these eight parts. The important pieces are parts one through four. This is where you have your terms and definitions, which defines 14 different kinds of functional coatings. Part two gives you how to describe the optical properties for the coating, including a graphic representation. You can actually do this graphically now. Um, part three is, is environmental durability, like how do you describe um, uh, environmental testing and what kind of survivability testing you need for coatings. And then there's some specific test methods we used in optics coatings, abrasion, adhesion, and so forth. Those are described in part four. And, and really, I view parts one to four of 9211 as an essential part of ISO 10110. There's also really important system testing standards. Um, the resolution um, resolution is usually measured using a, uh, um, a spatial frequency response or MTF. Um, ISO 15529 describes how to calculate all of these and ISO 12233 actually goes into the details of how to test for it. Uh, relative illumination, um, distortion, transmittance and stray light, these are just pretty much um, required on any optical system drawing. You've got to have a way to evaluate these different optical performance parameters. There are lots of other ones, um, but this is sort of a, these are the ones that kind of show up repeatedly in optical testing. Um, the ISO system actually also has subcommittees dedicated to specific applications. And each of those committees have developed their own standards for performance of their particular products. So ISO 14490, Parts one through nine, that describes all about how telescopes are supposed to work. Uh, endoscopes are described in 8600. Microscopes are des described in 1912 and 1956, um, and so on. So if you're, if you're not working on telescopes, you really don't need to worry yourself about 14490. It might have value to you, but you really don't have to think about it. But if you are working on telescopes, then you probably need to familiarize yourself with those standards as well. Um, last section I want to cover is the environmental standards. ISO 10109 provides standard environments. So this tells you what kinds of environments you should expect if, for example, your optical system will be deployed in the Arctic or at a very high altitude or just in a lab environment, right? Um, and so it describes these different standard environments. And then ISO 90. 22 parts 1 to 23, they go into the details of all the different kinds of tests you would need to validate that that optical system can survive in that environment. And these have their own notation. It can go right onto an optics drawing. Uh, you describe whatever the environmental test is, um, the ISO base number, the conditioning method, the degree of severity, and then whether or not the system has to be operating or it, it can be unplugged or whatever. Right. So this is a really powerful notation for the system level testing, which ultimately we have to get to. At the coding level, 9211 followed the notation of the environmental testing, right? So it has basically the same set of rules. Durability test is described as an abrasion test or an adhesion test. You reference the ISO base number, describe the conditioning method, and then describe the degree of severity that's required for that application. I mean, obviously, we can't go into all the detail here, but um, hopefully you get the idea that these these other standards actually really bring a lot to the optics party. And it's not just about components, after all. It's also about systems and coatings. And it, it, all of it pulls together into a single system. So here is an example of an optical system. This is a telescope, right? I think it's, uh, what kind is it? It's like a, looks like a... Gurky variant pets fall or something. Um, but anyway, it's a it's some kind of a telescope system. And in this system, it describes how you put it all together. There's reference uh, bullets for each of the individual components. Those will probably be different sheets on this document. And then the upper left hand corner tells you about environmental tests. And then the right hand corner tells you about what the uh, tilt and decenter is for each of the components, right? So it's it's a it's a total system that you can wind up using to describe your optical components, your assemblies, and your testing requirements. Okay, so real quick, I want to talk about 
where we're going, right? So hopefully I've convinced you that standards actually facilitate commerce by harmonizing industry. And they're an important piece of optical design, engineering productivity, and time to market. And the centerpiece in the optics world is ISO 10110. That's your pull point. You're going to start with ISO 10110 and then look at the reference standards for where to, where to go for the other test requirements. Um, <clears throat> I view ISO 10110 as absolutely mandatory for the 21st century. There is no other path forward. Every other standard ha system has been withdrawn at this point. And more importantly, uh, the United States is adopting, they have just voted to adopt ISO 10110 as American national standards. So there's no going back at this point. We have decided we are going to adopt ISO 10110 as an American national standard. You'll be able to buy them on the ANSI web store by the end of this calendar year. And we've decided that we're going to just publish all parts unmodified as American national standards. And that includes ISO 9211. ISO 9022, ISO 10109, and, all, and these other augmenting standards that you really need. So these are going to become American national standards. What's going to happen next? I think uh, diffractive optics should be published this year. Um, surface form notation and metrology is going through revision right now because we need to be able to enable CMM testing, for example. Um, and there's also the, the Zernike notation that we had in the original version was, was a great idea, but it really wasn't completely baked. So we've revised the way you're going to specify Zernikes if you're going to specify Zernike terms in your surface form. Uh, there was a complete omission that we didn't have Zernike fit residuals, which is obviously, this is a common need. So we needed a notation for that. And then there's a whole bunch of other things we're fixing. Um, we're also revising in 2024, we'll be publishing a new version of the centering notation. So this is part six. Um, and the, the big thing here was this massive omission that I don't know how we missed it. Um, it did not really have any notation for tilt of a surface. It was a centering standard, not a tilt standard, even though it really described surfaces by tilt. But you couldn't technically use it for prisms and windows based on the language of the standard. So we, we revised, we're in the process of revising that now. Um, we're going to enhance the way you do beam deviation notation. And, and real important piece is the datum indications have always been problematic since 1999. And we really need to clean up how we describe them and, and what their meaning is. Um, we're also going to see a continued improvement in the environmental encoding specifications. And the goal is by 2025 to harmonize these with ISO 10110. So that, that's one notation system for codings, environment, system testing. Okay and surface properties. So that's really it. Um, whether you agree or disagree with this direction, I, I encourage everybody to get involved. Um, development of national standards does not take that much time. Uh, working on the ISO standards is really rewarding and again, doesn't take very much time at all. Uh, we do have occasional meetings, certainly pre-COVID we did, and I think we're getting back to that now. Um, if we have foreign nationals here, I, I recommend you contact your country standards group. There's this like scary thing where we say you need to be an expert to participate. What we're really talking about is just people who are, you guys are all experts in optics, right? Compared to a, a, a short order cook, you know a lot about this subject. That's sufficient to be an expert. You don't have to be an expert expert. You don't have to have 30 years of experience to work on this. You just have to have a willingness to work with other people towards that common goal of published voluntary standards. That's it. So I hope you can find some time to get into this. And if nothing else, learn more about the standards that do exist. And even better, contact me and say, hey, I want to sign up. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting talk. I'm sure most people liked it. Now, there are some questions. I see already a couple of questions on the chat. Do you want to answer them directly by looking at the chat or you want to read them? Yeah, yeah, I can take a quick look. So Craig asked, um, question for the end, what are the status of IR material standards? Um, the infrared material standards for, um, so there's there's two efforts here, Craig. One effort, which I think is what you're talking about, is our effort to get measurements on infrared materials and then publish um, publish data on what germanium index and dispersion should be versus temperature, for example. Uh, that all kind of got put on the back burner during COVID. And so we really lost a couple of years. 
Uh, Adam Finis is already in talks with NIST to get them back on track to, to get them moving forward again. Um, cool. the, the other effort to just document infrared materials in general, that continues to go on at the international level. So we have a chalcogenide uh, glass standard that's currently under development. Uh, there's another one that's that uh, exists for UV materials. Um, but for the IR materials, I think there's just the chalcogenides and there's one other, either germanium or one of the zincs, I don't remember. But that's okay. that's an ongoing effort. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, is there a standard for figuring out the number for standards? Hey, yeah, how do they do it? Where do they come up with all these numbers? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. Um, it's actually, it is to first order purely sequential, Wayne. They just, they pick the next number in the list. But you can reserve blocks of numbers if you know you're going to have more in that same vein, right? So we own, we, um, uh, SC1 owns 14997, 998, 999, and maybe 14996 as well. And those were our testing method standards that we're going to go with ISO 10110. Like, for like reserving a parking space, right? Exactly. Although you can always just make more parts. That's that's the standard trick. Is the the standard trick is to yeah. um to just say okay, well we'll have four parts of fourteen nine nine nine, for example. And we, we actually just published a second part of 14997, the testing standard. It now has, in addition to the test methods for dimensional and scratch and dig, we just published a technical report on how to use machine vision to evaluate surface imperfections. So are you saying that there's no written prescription for how you do this? It's just like a protocol. Oh, no. Oh, no. There's uh, the ISO directives. Actually, uh, there's two parts to the ISO directives, part one and part two. And yeah. this it goes into gory detail on when oh, you can reserve nice. numbers and when you can't and okay, all okay. the rules. <laughs> okay, we give up. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, come on. You're going to ask standards writers to create a standard about standards. Exactly. You know they're on board. Thank you. Govin, we have a couple of questions in the room here. All right. So we'll go ahead. If you want somebody want to ask, they should go uh -huh. ahead. Okay. I had a question about um, the reform surfaces. You had mentioned that uh, there's like some ambiguities in the ways that different people might describe a reform surface. What do you find are the most common points of contention or most common ambiguities that people uh, run into? Um, well, so what I was referring to is that different people use the word freeform differently. Um, you know, two of the most ambiguous terms in precision optics today are freeform and three mare and astigmat. You can get the U of R interpretation and the Arizona interpretation and the German interpretation and the Japanese interpretation of all of those terms. And, and they mean different things to different people. So they've, because they are, they are used differently so much, they are useless, right? So, so there are plenty of people who would say, for example, an off-axis A-sphere is a freeform, right? Because it has only a an, an, um, plane symmetry. It does not have axial symmetry. There are others who would say, no, no, that's an off-axis segment because that surface has an axis of symmetry. It's just eccentric to the part. That's just an example, right? But you throw in toruses and cylinders and all sorts of other things and... It, it, you know, there are there are the strict interpretation, strict interpretationists, especially the ophthalmics community would say, if you have any symmetry, it is not a free form. So if there's a plain symmetry, that's not a free form. So anyway, so uh, when we were trying to write a standard, we just couldn't use that word because it didn't have a, a meaning. And moreover, the committee itself could not agree on what the word should mean. Right, what should be included, what should not be included. So we just said, you know what, we're not writing a standard on freeforms, we're writing a standard on surface descriptions. And so that's what we'll call it, generalized surface descriptions. That was the idea. Any other questions from Gargan 101? So, so David, this is Tom Brown. Thank you for the talk. That was Hi, really Tom. nice. Um, so my question, I, I saw on your list of upcoming topics, Diffract, diffractive optics. Um, and then, of course, we, we have half the world a little bit too excited, perhaps, about uh, something that they call metasurfaces, which mm -hmm. the people that started working on diffractive optics just 
decided that meta services are just another form of diffractive optics. Mm -hmm. What's being done in that direction to characterize scatter? Because that becomes so, so important for systems that have those kind of microstructures. That's a really great question, Tom. So, um, so the committee has discussed metasurfaces. We concluded that um, it is not industrial yet, although it's getting close. It's more of an academic pursuit at this point. So until more standard products are released and standard product methods are published, we kind of can't really, um, th there's not much of a role for international standardization yet is what I'm saying. But we did conclude that scatter from metasurfaces was important. And so we are actually in the process of revising the the only tool we had for scatter was a, a veiling glare specification in ISO 10 or in ISO. And so we're massively overhauling that veiling glare spec to include uh, stray light, veiling glare, and scatter. And that that's the the idea is to create some standardized test methods around how you would calculate this stuff. And that, so we're keeping an eye on it. We have an ad hoc group which consists of representatives of all the subcommittees actually that meets uh, about once a month. And we are keeping a close eye on specifically VR AR, these emerging product consumer product markets, which are going to move very quickly. And we wanna jump right on top of the standards opportunities as soon as they present themselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Dave, there are also three other questions came on chat, chat we want to, Answer. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so George asks, um, how about coded optics uh, that are epoxied together? Is there any delamination standard in the coding section? No, actually. Um, and this is, it, it wouldn't show up in the coding section, George. It would probably show up in surface imperfections, right? Because surface imperfections includes bond surfaces. But it's, it's very poorly treated. And um, it's on the list of things we need to revise the standard to accommodate. If you look at the mill standard, there's quite a reasonable specification for delamination. It's, it's kind of loose, to be truthful, but um, at least there's something there. Um, it, it doesn't exist today in ISO. And then next question from Sue was um, from a librarian. How are the standards priced? Some are very expensive. So. Um, Let's see, I guess I can say this while we're still recording, Sue. <laughs> I absolutely agree with you. I think the ISO standards are insanely priced uh, and they're not priced in a way that accommodates industry, much less academia. And um, so we can't do much about that except it turns out that when an, a standard is adopted as a national standard, right? So we're currently ISO 10110 is being adopted as an American national standard. We set the price and we can pick whatever price we want. And then we pay a fraction of that price to ISO. So we are deliberately pricing the American national standards way below what the generic version of ISO 10110 would cost. And the, the goal there is to just, you know, get that price down because it needs to be more accessible. It's not enough in my opinion, but it's better than, it's what we could do, you know? <laughs> Sometimes you just kind of poke the bear and see what happens. Okay, next question. Um, uh, does 10110 describe how to specify side two of a biaspheric lens? The lens design programs define the sag along the optical axis, but the lens is measured from this. Uh, this is another great question. Um, actually, we do describe this particular case. And in my course on ISO 10110, I make a big deal of this. Um, and what, what the, the question is really pertaining to the coordinate system of an aspheric surface, right? So if you have a biaspheric, um, I, I forget which way it goes. I think the, the way the optical design codes work, uh, the SAG is always going from left to right. I think that's right. So that means that ZMAX or Code 5 or Oslo or any of them is going to show your SAG going into the lens for the left-hand surface and out of the lens for the right-hand surface, right? And um, we, we actually need to define it differently or make it perfectly clear if we mean both into or both out of the surface. And so in, uh, in when we redid part one of 10.1.10, we were, took a lot of care to make sure we described properly the way you would do that conversion. So instead of always using a right-hand coordinate system, you can actually flip your coordinate system. Well, it's still right-handed, but you can flip your coordinate system so that your SAG table is going in the right direction. 
And oddly enough, that's not standard either. Different countries use different standards. Some have um, some standardize on SAG being positive if it's away from the surface. Others have SAG being positive if it's going towards the surface. So e even something as simple as that needs to be defined somewhere on the drawing. I think that's all the questions I've gotten in chat. Were there any other questions from, from Gergen 101? Any other questions from anyone? Last, last call? I have a question. Yeah, Duncan, go ahead. Yeah. This is, this is Duncan. Yeah. So I'll put, go on live. How are you? Oh, hey there. How are you, Duncan? It's good to see good. you. So what, what is the role now in the United States of NIST? I mean, the S still stands for standard, but oh, yeah. do, they, do they really do any of these standards that have, you know, are international? I mean, it's, I know people that have, have represented um, optics, you know, from NIST, but I'm not, it's not quite clear to me how this all works. Do they pay for as part of the, the programs or how does that work? Okay, so that's uh, another good question. Um, so the, the, the answer really is NIST is part of commerce and it is a politically run organization as are all parts of the executive branch. And they respond to, um, uh, they respond to incentives. And so NIST is, is strongly incentivized to respond to very large American corporations. So, right. so if it is a big American corp, they have a lot of weight in convincing NIST to work on semiconductors or laser safety or whatever it is. Um, the And optics just never makes the cut. It just, it, I think they're, they're always very interested in helping. They understand that we could really use some help, but um, it just never quite gets to the level where it gets the active support that we really need. Um, and but I gotta I gotta qualify that by saying we have a guardian angel at NIST, which is Marla Dowell in Boulder. And she has made sure that because it's the least she can do, she cuts us a check for a few thousand dollars every year to OEOSC to just defray the cost of representing the United States at the international standards level. And she keeps providing people, unfortunately they get promoted and whatnot, but she keeps providing people to serve as experts for the specific um, standards that affect NIST, which is, is better than nothing. So Marla's been wonderful. Unfortunately, she's now a director. So she doesn't have time to actually, she's actually worked as project leader on some of these standards. She wrote 14999 part four, for example. So, you know, so you, we can't say that NIST has done nothing for us, but we can say they've done less than we would have hoped. Okay. That's what I thought. Well, uh, okay. okay. Thank you very much for, uh, I think everybody appreciated your giving this uh, talk and telling us about standards. So with that, I will, uh, I will close this session. Uh, let me thank you very much for that. All right. So with thank that, you. We could uh, call it quit. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye.